The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Hyman. Today, we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, November is National Caregiver Month. And we're going to discuss some tips that family caregivers can use to keep their disabled or elderly loved ones safe while at home. Then afterwards, we'll learn about an award given to an accomplished leader in cancer research who's providing significant contributions. Then a little later on, we'll talk with a career expert on overcoming social anxiety that so many people face during this COVID-19 pandemic. And then also, we'll speak to a Metro Plus campaign health person who's actually doing his best to educate New York City employees on selecting the proper health insurance plan. And then we're gonna learn about a not-for-profit that's supporting black and brown communities through the preparation and distribution of nutrient-rich meals. And then finally, we'll discuss the importance of mental conditioning and how one company is building skills to help people deal with life challenges. So we want you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. I'm Darren Jaime, and welcome to Open. Today is Wednesday, November 17th, and you're watching the show that opens the Bronx and New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the Eminem channel. We encourage you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV, and then also on our website at BronxNet TV. Org. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through the course of this past week. We'll take you through a couple of things with our Bronx updates. Well, we start off with transit news. The MTA is inviting Bronx residents to be a part of their network's redesigned final plan public hearing for public comment on two proposals that are related to the addition of two new bus routes and the creation of bus lanes to improve services. Our Broxton reporter Arlene Makoko brings us the details as the community prepares. It's a plan that could mean the removal of up to 18% of the Bronx's bus stops while potentially adding a new BX25 route that would link Co-op City in the East Bronx to Lehman College on Bedford Park Boulevard while adding new bus lanes and more. All this with the goal of speeding bus service for borough residents. Buses are the engine of equity. We have to create a better bus system. We have to make sure that people can get on the bus and, may, and get somewhere that they're trying to go in a reasonable time frame. Jano Lieber, acting chair and CEO of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, joined Bronx World President Ruben Diaz Jr., city council member and candidate for the office of the Bronx World President, Vanessa Gibson, and others here to invite the Bronx to the final public hearing on the Bronx Bus Network Redesign Final Plan on November 9th at 6 p.m. The plan is a critical step towards bringing better, more reliable, and faster bus service to the 635,000 Bronx bus customers. And while that number is pre-pandemic, we are confident these riders are coming back to the system. According to data by the MTA, buses moved at an average pace of 7.4% in 2020, down from 7.5% in 2019, when the average daily ridership was 416,000 compared to 268,000 in 2020. Cipriano shared the public hearings with the last one in fall of 2019 do make a difference. After receiving feedback from the public, community, and elected officials, and reassessing existing conditions, we determined that the BX28 and BX34 route alignments would go back to the original way they were. 
Liberal President Diaz Jr., among other leaders here, called the agency responsive. Almost every single time when we went to transit, when we went to the MTA, and we said these are our concerns, they said we hear you, and they changed it. And so a year and a half later, while we faced COVID-19 and we had to put this proposal on pause, I'm really grateful that we are reconvening and having hearings so that residents of the Bronx can come together and express their concerns. Speaking from Archer Avenue and Parsons Boulevard in Queens at the launch of their bus pilot program, New York City Commissioner for the Department of Transportation, Henry Gutman shared his agency's commitment to work with the MTA in their goal to improve service citywide. Buses are the workhorses of our, of our mass transit system and in particularly in underserved communities where there isn't a subway and there isn't going to be a subway. I mean, the buses are the key. To register, go to new.mta.info slash Bronx Bus Redesign. For BronxNet, this is Arlene Makoko. And thank you, Arlene. We will continue to follow this story and much more. That's about all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We want you to stay connected to us because Open continues coming up right after this. Welcome back. November is National Caregiver Month, and with New York State's senior population growing and eight times faster than the state's total population over the last decade, VNSNY Partners in Care is providing home care services matching the needs of their clients from bathing and grooming all the way up to skilled nursing. Now, joining us to share more details is VNSNY's Partners in Care Director of Quality, Debbie, uh, I should say Deborah O'Hare, the Sister Director of Quality and Education. We've got Kenya Deleggi, and we thank you both for sharing with us here on the show. Good morning. Debbie, I'll, good morning, good morning. And Debbie, I'll begin with you. Um, as we talk about National Caregivers Month, I mean, we pretty much know, uh, we hear the term caregiver, but can you uh, give us some legs on what exactly is a caregiver for somebody who doesn't know? So a caregiver at Partners in Care is a VNSMY Partners in Care uh, would be a, a home health aide that comes in and as you said, assist with grooming, assistance to appointments, um, as well as we offer nurses to come in and provide an array of services as well. But they, they you know, there's a professional caregiver and then there's the non-professional caregiver, which is family members, loved ones, who care for um, individuals in the important part of the community and you know keeping individuals safe and, and healthy at home. And Kenya, for you, uh, a little bit about caregivers because I know during this time of year, uh, we're highlighting caregivers, but one of the things that I know that you guys really specialize in is dealing with that senior population. And one of the things that happens with seniors is really uh, a lot of times they tend to fall. So. Talk to us about what you do in terms of preventing falls and what somebody else can do in terms of helping a senior to prevent falls. So um, falls prevention is a vital part in keeping our loved ones safe in the home. So there, um, what safe means when you're in your 40s as opposed to when you're in 60s and 70s and 80s um, varies um, tremendously. So um, each Partners in Care um, client receives a clinical assessment by a trained nurse who reveals the physical, the mental, um, the mental health of a patient, of our, of our client population. So, and that includes um, vision and hearing and anything that could impact mobility, balance, and instability. So before a home health day is assigned, there is this um, comprehensive assessment, um, which includes um, a review of the home, of the home environment, and uh, there are many um, recommendations that to help um, our elderly population to stay home, <clears throat> to stay safely at home. Um, to name a few, there's um, grab bars in the bathrooms, um, mm -hmm. in tub, tub or shower and toilet. And remember not to use towel racks because it's very um, unsafe and unsteady to use towel racks. So, um, properly installed grab bars, a chair for the shower, lights in the stairway um, or 
in any point, any darker corners. Um, you need very well lighting in the home. And we also often recommend removing throw rugs or anything that they can trip or slip or fall on, on any particular um, uh, loose area rugs. Mm -hmm. um, and our home health aides, you know, they assist with keeping clutter, um, uh, keeping the environment clean um, because clutter can, um, can, uh, uh, can lead to a fall event. And making sure the, um, the shoes that the individual is wearing in the home is not slippery. And there are many, many tips around um, falls prevention, but these are a couple of a, a little bit, a, a tiny <laughs> different um, aspects of the home environment that could impact um, and potentially prevent a fall event. Yeah, thank you. And Debbie, uh, I want to take a moment just to look at some of the things that, you know, caregivers have to deal with when it comes to seniors. And sometimes you've got to deal with seniors who are dealing with dementia uh, and not just dementia, but also Alzheimer's as well. Uh, and for family members, it's hard to really be able to determine uh, whether or not their family member is really in that stage or not. But talk to us a little bit about the work that you do and, and, and really how we can detect whether or not something is wrong there. So, uh, you know, again, uh, what you just said, so I know for me, watching family members uh, struggle with memory loss and cognitive lapses um, as an adult child, it can be very difficult. Um, you know, we frequently refer to these as senior moments, um, but they're really a part of normal aging um, and that some of them require medical attention. You know, many people think that dementia is Alzheimer's and there's actually a difference. Um, in dementia is not all diseases, is not a disease at all. It's more of a, a used term to describe symptoms that interfere with the brain functions, especially in social and in intellectual um, abilities. So dementia, you might see a change in me memory, a change in language, uh, you know, and problem solvings, as well as just general, general confusion. Um, you know, for a family member or a loved one to recognize, um, loved ones like might not recognize them. Um, you know, and if a, if a family, if a, if a loved one shows signs of cognitive problems uh, that you worry and speak to your physician, the, the doctor um, probably will run a variety of tests and assessments to determine the cognitive ability, it's so important to get help, um, you know, because it can be very frustrating and you're gonna have a lot of concerns and emotions. So um, it's, it's really important for the loved one to get help as well, um, because even if uh, the dementia isn't treatable, as I said, it can deal with frustrations and concerns and you wanna address them so you can be a better caregiver to, to your loved one. Yeah. Um, no, uh, I didn't mean to cut you, but uh, I'll say since you, since you stopped, got about two minutes left, but I want to be able to talk a little bit about this because when we talk about uh, where we are today, a lot of seniors are really dealing with isolation uh, and really socialization challenges because just being home and not being able to connect. Uh, as a caregiver, uh, how do you go about helping them in this area of connectivity? I'll, I'll hear from you both. Um, we're almost two years into the pandemic, and it's been very difficult for everyone. Um, homebound or older people who don't get out as much as they used to can be at risk for depression if they're alone day in and day out. And everyone's needs are very different. Um, isolation, for example, which is the amount of contact with friends and family, doesn't necessarily lead to loneliness, which is how a person actually feels. You can live with someone or have people around you and still feel lonely. And other people are perfectly content with spending time alone and, and being home alone. But the partners and care caregivers take many different things into consideration. And it's something that um, family members um, should ask yourself, how is your family member overall health? Um, is the limited mobility a common reason for isolation? Uh, the inability to drive a car, um, every, there are particular things that will lead to loneliness and depression. And um, does the uh, loved ones, do they visit? Do they get phone calls? Do they FaceTime with grandchildren? Um, and there are particular signs and symptoms that our caregivers are um, trained to um, observe and report. 
that could mean depression and loneliness. Well, I definitely want to thank you guys for joining us, ladies. I should say not guys, I can be more specific, but thank you ladies for joining us and really sharing a little bit about the work that's being done during National Caregivers Month, because it's so important. And I think the work that you do is tremendous and uh, partners in care, being a partner uh, with VNS NY for really taking care of our seniors and that vulnerable population really sometimes goes under noticed and under celebrated, but we want to thank you for both for being with us and sharing some much needed tips as well. Thank, Thank you, you so Darren. much. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. And I want to let you know, now listen, if you want more information, always visit the website, vnsny.org. Also follow them on their Instagram and Facebook page at vnsny. We do have more show coming up. Don't go anywhere because Open continues coming up right after this. And welcome back. Our next guest has received a prestigious Outstanding Investigator Award from the National Cancer Institute. Now, this award is accompanied by a grant to study the molecular and cellular mechanisms leading to two related blood diseases, myelodysplastic syndromes and acute myeloid leukemia. Joining us to share more details, we are pleased to be joined by the co-director of the Blood Cancer Institute, and Associate Director of Basic Science at the Albert Einstein Cancer Center, Dr. Ulrich G. Steidel. And thank you so much, Dr. Steidel, for being with us. Uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure to have you. And uh, congratulations on this award. It's very prestigious. And uh, for people who don't know about this prestigious Outstanding Investigator Award, what exactly is that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the The Outstanding Investigator Award is is one of the most competitive and, and as you say, prestigious awards uh, of the National Cancer Institute or, or NCI. And the NCI is a federal institute that supports and funds cancer research, both clinical and preclinical, uh, in the entire U.S. And and the ultimate goal is really to develop new treatments and cures for all different types of, of cancer. And you know, this specific award is, is uh, accompanied by a seven year, $7 million grant to study the molecular and cellular causes of myelodysplastic syndromes and acute myeloid leukemias, as you mentioned, uh, which are two related uh, blood cancers. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, my, my, my team and I, and uh, within the framework, of our NCI designated uh, Albert Einstein Cancer Center and within the Montefiore Health System, uh, we're obviously very pleased and honored uh, to have received one of these highly regarded awards. And, and we're very excited about the opportunity to use these uh, grant funds uh, to perform research, to obtain new insights and to work towards developing new treatments and hopefully even cures you know, for these usually fatal blood disorders. Yeah. Can you take the time and uh, just explain for our viewers just a little bit more, because we're talking real, you know, medical terms here, but for somebody who doesn't know, um, and I know you're studying about the uh, myeloplastic syndromes, the acute myeloid leukemia, how, uh, can you explain those conditions from a more lay person's perspective for somebody who may not be so familiar? Uh, absolutely. So, so myelodysplastic syndromes or, or MDS uh, they occur when blood forming stem cells in the bone marrow acquire genetic and non genetic irregularities and then lead to the production of abnormal and, and dysfunctional blood cells. And uh, those cells then outcompete uh, the healthy normal cells. And, and that leads to many of the common symptoms, which include anemia, fatigue infections, bleedings, uh, bleeding and, and others. And um, the, the incidence of MDS in the United States is not entirely clear, but uh, estimates range from 10 to 40,000 new cases annually. And about 30% to half of these patients with MDS will actually then go on to develop acute myeloid leukemia or AML, which is an even more aggressive form of blood cancer. 
And, uh, you know, the problem is that uh, treatment for MDS is generally limited to, to preventing or reducing complications, particularly anemia. And the only cure is a bone marrow transplant, which is a therapy, very aggressive therapy that's not easily tolerated uh, and, and therefore often only feasible for the youngest and, and most resilient patients. I want to talk about the Bronx for a minute because in all the work that you're doing and what we're talking about right now, it plays a very important part with the Bronx. Uh, talk about how the Bronx is connected to all of this. Yeah, so thank you for that uh, question. You know, uh, let, let me start with saying that the work we're doing under this award is, is really is fundamental in nature and, and will thereby likely be applicable to and, and benefit a broad spectrum of patients in the entire U.S. and, and in fact, worldwide. Uh, however, you know, you're, you're alluding to the very important topic of, of health disparities here. And, you know, while such disparities are particularly well documented um, with regards to clinical cancer care, clinical trials, it's important to note that, that preclinical research also, you know, uh, needs to be part of, of this discussion. And, and now, obviously, the Bronx is one of the most diverse counties in the entire US. And I, what I would like to point out is that almost all of our preclinical work here under this award, but also in general at, at Einstein Montefiore is done with, with samples from our highly engaged patient community uh, here in the Bronx. And that means uh, you know, that the results we're obtaining, even in this preclinical setting, um, are particularly relevant to the specific population groups and, and various backgrounds that our patients are from here in the Bronx and, and that are typically less represented at many other centers uh, in the country and, and also internationally. And we, we therefore feel that we're making an important contribution also in, in that regard and, and with, you know, uh, for the Bronx specifically. Yeah. Before we go, I just want to ask the question about, do you ever feel that there'll be a way to, you know, effectively deal with these uh, blood disorders? Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, so, um, you know, absolutely. So, so the, um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's important, you know, to know that while there are treatments for MDS and AML, mainly chemotherapy combinations, the, the clinical outcomes in, in MDS and AML have not significantly improved over the past 50 years. And the cure rates remain below 15% for most patients. And there's really an urgent need to improve our understanding of these diseases and develop and devise more effective therapies. And one of the key problems is that while patients typically respond well to initial chemotherapy, uh, the treatment success is only very short-lived and, and patients relapse and then often with uh, even more aggressive disease, disease, which then cannot be controlled uh, for much longer. And in recent research, including from our own team, has shown that both MDS and AML arise from so-called precancerous stem cells, um, you know, a subpopulation of blood-forming stem cells that have acquired genetic and non-genetic abnormalities. And, and certain varieties of those stem cells, so-called clones, they then go on to develop into leukemia and, and are also capable of sustaining the cancer. And, and you know, unfortunately, these precancerous stem cells are particularly resistant to drugs. And, and we now know that the considerable diversity of these stem cell varieties and clones affect uh, the development and progression, but also disease uh, uh, treatment resistance of both uh, MDS um, and AML. And, and that you know, really brings us right to the goals of, of our work. You know, what, what causes uh, some of these precancer of stem cells, but not others um, to become leukemic, it's not entirely clear, but our recent work has shown that the actions of a group of proteins that normally turn on and turn off genes in a, in a highly coordinated manner, uh, so-called transcription factors, they behave abnormally in these preleukemic stem cells. And what we'll do is we'll try to elucidate and better understand these abnormal transcription factors 
and how they lead to leukemia uh, in stem cells. And, and again, mm -hmm. the goal is that we can then target those transcription factors directly and, and therapeutically, you know, with, with drugs in the future. Well, Dr. Stoddard, we got to leave it there, but thank you for the work that you've done. Congratulations on your award. And certainly we'll be looking forward to finding out more about how this plays out in the near future. Thank you, Dr. Stoddard, for being with us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. All righty. Well, I want to let you know now, if you want more information, visit the website at EinsteinMed.org. And of course, you can follow them on social media at Einstein College of Medicine. Do have more show going, uh, continuing. Uh, we ask that you stay with us. Open is coming up right after this. And welcome back. Our next guest experience dealing with social anxiety in her career actually inspired her to help motivate others struggling with the feelings of self-doubt as well as a lack of career strategy. And uh, the question is, how can one actually start to conquer and deal with social anxiety in today's current job market? Uh, joining us to share more details is career expert and founder at Black Swan Careers, Olga Ektida. And we thank you so much for being with us. And uh, good to have you, Olga. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Ah, honored to have you. And I mean, I think <laughs> it's a very worthwhile conversation to have because, you know, a lot of people have angst about going back to work. And when yes. you talk about going back to work and, you know, really just starting to reintegrate in society, you know, we're now finding that more and more people actually suffer from social anxiety. So for somebody mm -hmm. who may not know what social anxiety is, let's put a definition to that. So social anxiety, I think, can be completely different depending on the individual. Um, it is so individualistic. And social anxiety is essentially when you get anxiety in social settings, right? This could be at work. This can be out. This can be at your local coffee shop, right? You don't know when it's going to trigger. It's just going to trigger. And it makes you anxious. It makes it really difficult to have conversations. Uh, it, it really is an inconvenience. And that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when you talk about that, it's hard to stay locked in, right? I mean, you know, yeah. I can be talking to you and then uh, you're just not locked in because of social anxiety. Give me a little bit about what are the actual effects of it that once you start really dealing with it, what are the effects? Yeah. I mean, I think, again, it's, it's so different depending on the individual, but for me personally, uh, so I have difficulty breathing. It feels like somebody's sitting on my chest. I have difficulty like conversing and having conversations. Um, it just feels very limiting in the sense that you want to say stuff and you want to come into the conversation being your best self, really giving 110% into every conversation, right? Every day. Uh, and it, you just can't. You, you can't find the voice. You can't find uh, the power to speak up for yourself. It, it can be very debilitating. Many people right now are struggling with this because uh, we're trying to get back to work. Uh, we know that there is this thing that's uh, known as an employee shortage. A lot of people are really dealing with that, but yep. you're still going out there. People are still going out there and trying to find jobs. Uh, so if I have social anxiety and I've got to go to my job, I've got to, you know, conduct the, or at least get an interview to, to do that. Yeah. I can sometimes mess it up with an interview, right? Just by not mm -hmm. being the right in the right in the right framework what kind mm -hmm. of advice do you give what kind of uh, suggestions do you give for somebody who may be dealing with this and has to go through that whole phase of you know interviewing and re-entering into the work uh, into the workforce yeah i think first and foremost and this is something that has taken me a while is just be kind to yourself understand that this is absolutely normal um this uh i think a lot of times when we we think of any any sort of mental health issues in general in the workplace is always whether people say it or not, it's perceived as a weakness potentially, right? Or people are afraid that it'll be perceived as a weakness. And even, even now, you know, companies are speaking about mental health and, and advocating for it. But I can't truly say that as somebody with anxiety, I feel still 100% comfortable being a leader and saying, I have, I have anxiety, right? This is the first time that I'm doing this. And so if I'm having an issue with it, I know that other people are having issues with it as well. Um, and so I think one, be kind to yourself, understand that this is absolutely normal. This is something that you can with a routine uh, manage, right? And I think the second thing, and this is something that took me a little while to realize as well, is that there is no like 
one size fits all solution for every individual, um, but there is a way to manage it through things like meditation, exercise, right? Having a really nice routine in the morning that sets you up for success for the rest of the day. Um, and it's finding what works for you and what really puts you in that really great frame of mind and combining it throughout the day to uh, really ensure success and, and, and committing to it as well. Um, I mean, let's be serious. We're all human here. Uh, I have I have a routine in the morning, right? But do I do it every single day? Absolutely not. Life is busy, right? And so right. Uh, it's one of those things where uh, you just, you create a routine, you have the things that you know are really good for you, um, but you also be kind to yourself when life does get in the way and you're not necessarily doing everything that you should be doing. Um, because what at, over time is you commit to these things, you realize how much it helps you and you'll just naturally gravitate back. And by being kind to yourself versus beating yourself up over, I didn't do this, I didn't do that. You're actually causing yourself more anxiety that way. Um, so be kind to yourself, have a routine that works for you. Um, and that, that takes testing, right? But there are strategies that you can implement that have been researched that work um, mm -hmm. and, and just take it day by day. For yourself, you know, you've actually taken your career and, and, and your challenges and you've actually put them together. You've got a course and a workshop that's available. So uh, for our viewers, let our viewers know a little bit about the course and the workshop and how they may be able to participate. Yeah, so uh, my company is called Black Swan Careers, right? And so our whole mission is to essentially help uh, ambitious job seekers find careers that they love by working smarter, not harder. Um, so historically, when you think of searching for a job, you think of this arduous process of applying to hundreds of jobs and like not hearing back, getting ghosted. It's just a mess, right? And it doesn't have to be that way, right? And so within Cultivate Career Authority, um, that's what we teach. And it's two parts. There's a course as well as like a, a group intensive workshop. And we teach everything, everything from career clarity to ensuring that you're in the right mindset for the highs and the lows for a job search. Um, and then really uh, essential skills like interviewing and of course, negotiation, right? These are things that pay lifelong dividends. Uh, and what's so wonderful about Cultivate Career Authority is that the skills that you learn within the time that you're a student, um, you can use again and again and again throughout your life. This isn't a one-time thing. You can use this throughout your whole career. You can use this in your life. Uh, it, it's something that you can embed in every, like factor of your life, but especially your career. Amazing. And so I want to thank you so much for being with us and sharing this information. I want to make sure that people get involved and get connected yeah. to you because thank you, so uh, much. you know, you're providing a much needed resource for so many people who are going through this right now. So Olga, yeah. thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it was such an honor. It was so much fun. Yeah, well, we've got to have you back. Olga and Tina, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. And I uh, want to let you know if you want more information, please go ahead and visit her website, uh, blackswancareers.com. And then, of course, follow her on social media at Black Swan Careers. Going to take mm -hmm. a quick break. We do have more show. Don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up right after this. <music> Welcome back to the show. Metro Plus Health has recently announced a campaign to educate New York City employees on their choices when selecting a health insurance plan. Now, the campaign supports Metro Plus Health's ongoing commitment to providing affordable and quality health insurance to New York City municipal employees, as well as Don Medicare eligible retirees, qualified domestic partners, and eligible dependents. Here now to share a little bit more is the Chief Growth Officer at Metro Plus Health, Roger Milliner. And uh, Roger, good to have you. Thank you for having me. Hey, glad to have you. Now, when we talk about affordable health, I mean, really, affordable health insurance is that today is really uh, paramount in the lives of so many people. Uh, and I know that you guys at Metro Plus Health are really working uh, to make sure that people can become educated uh, when it comes to uh, having a health insurance plan. So talk to us a little bit about your campaign. So Metro Plus has been a health care provider of insurance for New Yorkers for over 35 years. Um, one of our most proud programs is our program for city employees. 
This is the fall transfer period where city employees have the ability to uh, join health, uh, health insurance plan for the first time, change their health care coverage. So we're launching a big campaign to promote all of our additional products and services that we're offering the city employees and to make sure that um, city employees know their options. Yeah. And so there is what's known as that enrollment period. But for somebody who may not be so familiar, walk us through exactly what is the enrollment period? So it's known as the fall transfer period. That's the time where any city employee who currently works in any of one of the city or mayoral agencies has the ability to change their health coverage. Usually you're in a health plan for about a full year, but you make changes in the fall transfer period or the open enrollment period. So from November 1st to November, is the opportunity for people to change health care, change health insurance plans. Um, and this is known as the open enrollment period. So we're actually in the enrollment period now, the fall transfer period. This is a great time for city uh, employees to start looking at what they like or don't like about their health insurance. What is, what, are, what is it covering? Changes do I want to make? Is it affordable for me? So now's the time to really look at your options. There's about 13 different options for employees to choose from. Metro Plus is the best option for people to choose. We're a very low cost uh, plan. Um, there's no payroll deduction um, if you want the basic plan. However, if you do want the option rider that gives you additional dental and vision services, then you would take the, the option rider. But the basic uh, plan with uh, no option rider is free. There'll be no payroll deduction. And so for you, you also have a plan that's really dedicated towards city workers. And I know that's called uh, the gold plan. So educate our viewers a little bit on the gold plan that's available because we do have some city workers out there. Let them know uh, what's, what's available. So Metro Plus Gold is a product specifically designed for anybody who works in one of the city agencies or mayoral agencies. This offers you a really, really cost-effective plan that has no payroll deduction. So I said, there's nothing coming out of the act on a bi-weekly basis if you get paid bi-weekly. So it's totally, there is no co-payments whenever you go to your physician. So you don't have to worry about that added burden of having to out of pocket for a copay when you go to the doctor. There's no co-payments at your specialist. So whenever you go to a specialist, it, you can rest assured that you don't have to come out of pocket and worry about any out of pocket costs. So no payroll deduction, no cost at your PCP, no cost at your specialist. Some city employees who are not unionized and they choose to take the rider for their prescriptions, they will have a very small copay, excuse me, a small deductible coming out of their uh, biweekly paycheck. We have the lowest option rider for anybody who needs that option to get their prescription drugs. We do go to the pharmacy. It's only $5 for your generic or brand name drugs. So it's a really affordable program. It offers access to over 3,400 providers throughout the city of New York. We have a very robust hospital network, which is inclusive of over 40 uh, hospitals in the five boroughs of New York City. We have tons of specialists. We have people who would want to go to large multi-practice facilities. We have those in our network. We have a ton of urgent cares and we actually added more urgent care centers to our network recently. So the network is really robust. So talk to us a little bit about what's going on right now because we have a new mayoral administration getting ready to take place. New York City has elected Eric Adams to uh, be the next mayor of New York City. Uh, what does that mean, do you think, from your perspective for healthcare and how things work for city workers? One of the most important uh, things that um, Eric Adams ran um, during his campaign was to really eradicate this COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic showed that there was a lack of coordination between healthcare providers, which is critical. It creates inefficiencies, inequities within our healthcare system, and it costs lives, and we've seen that. Um, so one of the most important things um, I know coming out of his campaign and as part of his uh, agenda moving forward is to make sure we really tackle COVID-19 and, and make sure that there's coordinated care amongst the healthcare providers and the system in New York. Um, he has a program, a plan uh, to build the city back healthier. He wants to have a healthy city that defends COVID-19 and improves the healthcare for city workers, for all New Yorkers, basically. And some of the main points I would say is that um, we need to close this racial, you know, healthcare that we have. We've seen that certain uh, communities were affected more than others. And so that's on the agenda to bring equity 
amongst the healthcare system um, in New York um, to form a, a united hospital system. You know, even though health and hospital is the city's own hospital system, at times it's been disjointed. And his plan is to really unify uh, a citywide hospital network. Um, I know also that he wants to improve preventable care and, and teach healthcare habits to make sure the New Yorkers are living healthy. And this is all good because Metro Plus is at the center of this plan. We are the city health plan. Uh, Metro Plus is a subsidiary of the New York City Health and Hospital System, which is the city's hospital system that uh, Eric Adams would be the, the mayor over this, this agency. Mm -hmm. um, other you know, key points where I think Metro Plus fits in well is that he wants to strengthen the safety net hospital system, expand on COVID testing and, and, and resources, uh, uh, and prevent health care uh, inequities in underserved communities, uh, treat social issues. Uh, Metro Plus has a lot of specific programs uh, through our social determinants of, of care model that's perfectly in line with uh, uh, the incoming mayor's uh, desire to um, um, treat social issues as part of the healthcare system because often uh, social issues were treated as a criminal issue or something like that. But now he wants to bring that in and be, have it treated as, a, as part of the healthcare system. And I think Metro Plus aligns well with that. He wants to expand on telehealth and Metro Plus has a great telehealth program. All through the pandemic, we, we really serve people well when they have the ability to go into a healthcare setting and telehealth was heavily used. So our telehealth program um, proved one that was very important during the pandemic and he wants to expand on telehealth services. Um, well, certainly we look forward to seeing what happens with the new mayoral administration. And we know the Metro uh, Plus Health is very connected to uh, taking care of city workers. And Roger, I want to thank you so much. He's uh, Roger Milner is our growth uh, officer, chief growth officer at Metro Plus Health. And uh, Roger, thanks for joining us. Sure. Well, let people know if you want more information, please visit them on their website, metroplus.org. And then also follow them on social media at Metro Plus Health. We do have more show. Don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up right after this. Our next guest grew up working in community gardens and studied the culinary arts before entering into the healthcare industry. Now she's a full-time chef, dedicated her career to fighting for food justice, supporting the health and nutritional well-being of black and brown communities and transforming food systems worldwide. Joining me now and sharing more details is the founder and executive director of the Black Chef Movement, Rashida McCallum. And uh, Rashida, good to have you back and glad to see you. Hi, James. Hi. Great to have you as well. Listen, uh, so congratulations. I know that you continue to, you know, do the work. When we first met last time, uh, you really were involved in taking care of protesters during the Black Lives Matter movement and bringing food care. But, you know, you really have uh, accelerated since then and really have got a heart and a passion for food justice. Yes, absolutely. So we were definitely born out of the summer protests. And doing all of the work in the community, we realized after the protests died down that there was still so much work to do. And for us, because we are the Black Chef Movement, we specialize in just providing food for low, low income Black and Brown communities. And so since then, that's something that we've been doing consistently. Uh, another effort that we like to make sure that we have our hands in is just um, feeding poll workers. Uh, that's one of our passions. We think that it's important that people go out and vote because if people aren't voting, then there aren't a lot of changes happening in our community. So that's something that we're definitely passionate about. Mm -hmm. And so for you, I know you've got a couple of drives coming up and some things happening as we prepare ourselves for the holidays. Share with us a little bit about what you got going on. Yes, so the holidays for a lot of us is 
a very special time. And unfortunately for some people, it's not so special because, you know, the pandemic happened. Some people are still out of work. And so we want to make sure that we're there for those folks and we're there for the community. And we like to emphasize hot meals. Last year, we had a hot food for the holidays food drive. And this year, we're going to continue the effort. We want to make sure that we're in these low income communities giving out hot meals so that people can truly, you know, enjoy their holidays. And that's something that we're really passionate about. We really get to meet uh, a lot of young people. We get to communicate with people, figure out what they need so that we can always continue to provide. Yeah. And I know, you know, you've been doing this for a minute and you talked about your work being actually born out of that summer when, uh, of course, the George, George Floyd protests uh, and really Black Lives Matter took to the streets. Uh, for yourself, you know, it's been an evolution of sorts. And for you, I know that the opportunity now to uh, receive recognition and uh, one of those recognitions coming from Mayor-elect uh, Eric Adams uh, while he was still working in Brooklyn. Oh my goodness, yes, we ha I have it right here. So yeah. amazing. Uh, you know, he just really wanted to recognize us for the work that we've been doing in the community. And, uh, you know, just to see how far that he's, he's going now, you know, and getting the chance to meet him and just to communicate with him and to talk to him and to tell us what to, for us to express to him what we need from him as our mayor, um, you know, is really impactful. And just to get, you know, this award from him, this citation, it really meant a lot to us to let us know that we are doing the work, we are in the streets, and, you know, really just to give us more motivation to keep on going. What can you tell us about this? Because uh, when you look at being out on the streets, it looks as though that, we're going to still be out there for a moment, but yet and still your commitment is really to making sure that everybody has a right to food and for those persons that are really serving on the front lines, make sure that they're covered and cared for. Uh, so give us a little bit about, you know, just your philosophy on, on, on how you see things right now. Well, there still <clears throat> has been, you know, a movement for just racial justice. There's a lot of injustice happening in the low income communities. Um, you know, I myself, I'm from the Bronx, um, but I grew up in Brooklyn and I've seen a lot of different things happening throughout different boroughs in uh, New York City. And it has a lot to do with inequities. Uh, so for us, I feel like we like to support the organizations who are working the long hours, who need access to food. These people who are doing the work on the front lines, they need food as well. So we like to use our resources to feed those folks in addition to feeding the people in the community. We just like to keep ourselves busy and have our hands in every pot that we can, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. But you know, it's a lot of fun. It's something I'm passionate about. Again, you know, I can say I'm from the hood. So it feels good to know that I can go back and serve these people because I know how it feels to not know where your next meal comes from. And I think a lot of people don't know that it's a real thing. Um, food insecurity is a real thing. Food deserts is a real thing. There's a lot of people who, you know, if a bodega closes, they have to travel a mile and get on a bus just to get to a supermarket. So we like to go into those communities and have food drives, get fresh produce that's always left over from these big corporations and give it back to the people who need it. Yeah. And so uh, if people want to get connected to what you got going on coming up, how do they go about doing that? please visit our website, blackchefmovement.org. We need so much volunteers. It's not even funny. If you are someone who, you know, you always wanted to give back and get involved, here's your chance. Please, we're welcoming you with open arms for all the family. Uh, so visit us on social media, blackchefmovement.org as well. And so as we continue and we talk about the work that's being done right now, and really trying to, you know, close the gap when it comes to this food desert let me just get your perspective right here from what you're seeing given the fact we're you know we're in another stage of COVID, uh, do you find things to be getting better or worse when it comes to this food insecurity um <clears throat> i feel like because kids are going back into schools that is helpful i do feel like there is room for more improvement but i think it's helpful that the kids are back in school because a lot of kids rely on school food for their meals. And that was one of the main issues in the beginning of the pandemic of why they couldn't close the schools because there is a homeless issue in NYC and there is a food insecurity 
uh, issue with NYC. So I do think it's helpful that the kids are back in school, but I do think that there's a lot of wealth in this country and the wealth needs to be spread around evenly so that people can eat, you know? It's, it's really important. Yeah. Well, Rashida, thank you so much for being with us, sharing the great work that you're doing and making sure that people are taken care of. Uh, and congratulations on how you've really accelerated uh, in this area of food justice and providing. So thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. All righty. Now, we want to let you know if you want more information, we encourage you to go ahead and visit the website, blackchefmovement.org, and then follow her on Instagram as well as Facebook at Black Chef Movement. We encourage you don't go anywhere. Open continues coming up right after this. And welcome back. Mental conditioning is relevant to all aspects of our everyday life. And our next guest, Liv, to add value to others by showing people how it all works together. The mental conditioning movement's mission is to train people's minds to operate at maximum capacity using principles, heightened decision-making skills, as well as goal-oriented prioritization. And here now to share a little bit more about mental conditioning, we are pleased to be joined by the co-founders of the mental conditioning movement, Elliot Allen and Michelle Allen, and I'm glad to have you both with us. Hi. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And Michelle, I'll, you know, just start off with you for a quick second. I mean, uh, you're doing some great work in terms of getting the community more aware of mental conditioning. And so from your perspective, uh, how do you, how do you really define mental conditioning? Well, I like to, and I'm going to pass it to my hubby, but how I like to really define it is I like to equate it in relevant to physical fitness, just like we go to the gym and we do physical fitness for our body, our health. And I'm, I'm big on that as well it's also important that our mind, our mind is just as important as our body. So it's equivalent to physical fitness and mental fitness. But hubby, I'm going to let you take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so as Michelle said, it's very, very important. It's very, very much a speaking point for us because, you know, when we talk about mental condition, as you opened up the show, you said it affects every aspect of our life. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that is exactly what we believe. But here's the piece that, you know, I think is very, very important in what we do here in the mental condition and movement. Everybody knows that, especially in this climate. Everyone today really talks a lot about mental health. But here's the piece that comes into play with us. We want everybody to understand the importance of mindset. We want everybody to understand that. It's one thing to know it, but to be able to understand where where we are with our mindset. Why are we sitting where we're sitting in our lives, whether it's we're sitting in a place that we want to sit or whether we're sitting in a place that we don't want to sit. We have to really understand, and I want to say that four and five times, understand, understand our mindset is really why, why we're sitting in those places. And then there's the second part to that is once we understand that, we have to do something about it. And here in the mental condition and movement, that's exactly what we do. We are work tremendously hard on training our minds to be able to grow, to be able to get strong, to be able to strengthen ourselves. And we do that through the basic principles uh, of mental conditioning, starting with the definition itself. So that's very, very important and very critical for us to be able to move forward. Yeah. And I know you got an event coming up to really uh, help people and get couples also engaged as well. And so, uh, Michelle, tell us a little bit about that. Right. So February 5th, 2022 is going to be our fifth couples night. So pre-COVID and only because of COVID is why we had to take a gap in how often we were giving it. So our fifth one is February 2022 is for couples to help us revive our love, our passion, our trust in our relationships. Um, same thing under the mental conditioning movement. You know, life throws us a lot of stuff, <laughs> right. mm -hmm. especially coming through this pandemic. So mm -hmm. we are as couples, as married couples, we are no less you know, immune to that. So the night is to strengthen the bond, strengthen the love, strengthen the connection that you have with your partner. And at the end of the night, that's what happens. That's what people call us back later and tell us like, we haven't talked like this with that much yeah. depth, you know, in years. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, mm -hmm. wow, really? You know, we know what we want it to be, but to hear it from their mouths is like, all right, that's it. That's what we wanted to do. Build the strength and the foundation of the family and that marriage. Without that strong foundation, what's going to happen? Things are going to crumble. Absolutely. So that's what the Couples Night of Love is about. 
And I want to tap into this, the gym, right? This mental conditioning mm -hmm. gym. So Ellie, for somebody who doesn't know about this gym, how do you, how do you get connected <laughs> and what's the gym about? Well, we're actually here in the gym we're right now. Gym. Yeah. You kind of see the background. <laughs> um, you know, the mental conditioning gym is actually something that really started seven years ago when we started the mental conditioning movement. And truthfully, the, the mental conditioning gym can be really be anywhere. Mm -hmm. It can be anywhere in which you're able to process your thoughts, in which you can actually start to train. But one of the challenges was to be able to answer that question you just gave me, which I get a lot. And so people say, well, where is, where is it? Where is it? So what we did, we said, you know what? Let's actually make it a place where people can actually come to actually get into that mindset to start to train their minds. Mm -hmm. So we actually structured. I'm a big boxing fan. So I think that boxing is a metaphor of life. So when you walk into our mental conditioning gym, it looks like a boxing ring. Mm -hmm. But mentally, you're challenged to be able to say, you know what? I'm here today to be able to mentally work on my mindset. And it puts you right into that frame of mind. And then we have great sparring partners to be able to spar with as you're in the gym and using the principles of mental conditioning. So it's a wonderful place. And we invite anybody to come out here and spar with us mentally because it's a great, great, great experience. Yeah. As couples, uh, do you feel that there's this power that you have in terms of like really being able to connect with so many other people who may be in that same boat, you know, marriages or relationships? And, you know, there is that disconnect sometimes as you, I think that, you know Michelle mentioned before you have this disconnect sometimes within with one to another and if you have to disconnect one to another when that translates to the outside world it could be even worse so so right. talk to us about you know just the power of just being able to uh you know connect couples uh it's a joy like when we do the couples night oh, of yes. love oh, yes. we we have a vision of how we, we want it to go but at the end of every single one it goes yes. much better yes. than how we anticipated to yes. see I, I can't even tell you the love in the room yes no matter what people are going through because not to say relationships are perfect not at all but to feel the love in the room is so palpable to count how many years of marriage is yes. there you have people as young as maybe I think someone was married a few weeks, okay? So the longest running couple was about 30, 35, 35 years. Yes, yes. So wow. you're like, whoa, we're babies compared to y'all, okay? You know, so <laughs> to, to feel that love and connection and those that are married for one year, looking at the ones that married 35 years, yes. you're learning from them. You're seeing their bonding connection with mm -hmm. each other. You know, the beauty of the night is that though we're all together in a private dining room, we're at our own tables. So it really is about that interaction between the two of you that bond between the two of you. But at the same time, those around you are watching you and they're learning from you. You know, we learn from action, right? It's not just always about talking. Action speaks yeah. louder than words. So they're watching you and building from that. It is an amazing feeling. It is. It is. Well, well, certainly I want to thank you guys for coming and sharing with us. I mean, it's very special to really think about, you know, how we have to really build our minds and you guys are really doing a great job of really putting it out thank there you. that, uh, you. you know, mental conditioning is very much necessary. And so <laughs> thank you for being with us and we definitely got to have you back. Thank, thank you. you. Thank We'd you. love to be back. Thank you. Thank you All righty. Well, Elliot, Michelle, thank you for the great work that you're doing in terms of really helping us to condition our minds. I think it's something we have to talk about the mental is uh, just as important. We talk a lot about the physical, but we don't always talk about the mental, but thank you so much for being with us and the work that you're doing. Now, listen, if you want more information, we encourage you to visit the website at mentalconditioningmovement.com. Then also you can visit them on social media as well as men at Mental Conditioning Movement. Well, we've come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us and most of all you, the viewer, for tuning in. And if you missed any part of the Recablecast, uh, I should say any part of the show, you can catch Recablecast on Broxess Channel 67. If you do have Rise and Files, that'd be Channel 2133 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Also want to let you know, we say a special thank you to our viewers who are watching on MNN's channel as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And we also want you to know that you can stay connected to us on our website here at bronxnet.org. Listen, if you're looking for a brand new episode, we come back on Friday morning. My girl, Rena Valentine will have the best in arts and entertainment. Uh, until then, I'm Darren Jaime saying thank you. God bless for watching our Wednesday slash Thursday open. And uh, we'll see you next week.